Um, I welcome everyone. If you don't mind putting um, your name or where you're from in the chat, just so we have a sense of who's with us. Um, we'd also love to hear what type of topics um, you'd like to hear about today. And this is a conversation. So please chime in in the chat as we're having um, our conversation with Donna Gaffney here today, who I'm so thrilled to be with. Um, Donna and I met many years ago. In fact, when I started doing this work, she was one of uh, the folks with who just welcomed me with open arms and has been so um, supportive over the years. And I'm just so grateful to know her because I'm sure as each of you read um, in preparation for this meeting, and I'll, I'll, I'll go over her bio here in just a moment, she's incredibly decorated um, in the field of grief and bereavement, not just as serving families, but also constructing responses for families um, facing tragedy and crisis. Um, she's long addressed trauma, loss, and grief in the lives of children, adults, and communities. As a psychotherapist and consultant, she provided expertise in the national disaster, in many national disasters, such as the Challenger explosion, which I remember vividly when our elementary school was uh, pulled together and we all watched that in the cafeteria the Pan Am 103 crash, which I also remember quite vividly, uh, the Sandy Hook massacre, the 2010 Haitian earthquake, and Hurricane Katrina. In addition to a, a number of academic publications, um, she is the author of The Seasons of Grief, Helping Children Grow Through Loss, and more, and we'll hear about that in a little while. She also has a long history of classroom um, and experimental and online uh, education, having taught and developed programs at the International Trauma Studies Program, Columbia and Seton Hall. She holds multiple master's degrees uh, from Teachers College, Columbia University and Rutgers, and her doctorate is from the University of Pennsylvania. Um, her postdoctoral work includes the Prudential Fellowship for Children and news at Columbia's Journalism School and the International Trauma and Studies Program. It is really quite our honor to be here with you today, Donna. And you can see just in the chat, we have people from all over the country um, joining us, all the way from Maui. Aloha, Kim, it's lovely to have you here. Must be several hours earlier for you. Um, and New Mexico, Salt Lake City, Massachusetts, we just have a, a number of people um, joining us because you have so much to offer. Um, again, I'll just invite folks to um, enter into the chat uh, the, the topics that most resonate um, for them and what they'd like to hear about. We, um, we do have some suggestions already, but we want to make sure that we cover ground. So, so with that, I just want to say welcome, Donna. Thank you so much for being with us, and we're really looking forward to today's conversation. I am really happy to be here today with um, speaking from, you know, coast to coast and across oceans, so um, it's wonderful. Uh, so I, uh, Joy Allen and I talked about how we would approach today, um, and I think we, Joy Allen, correct me if I'm wrong, I decided that we would actually talk about sort of a national um, Approach, you know, looking at a national trauma and loss, and how stories um, can help us understand that. Um, so, if that um, if that is okay, that would be with... a great place to start. Okay, great. Yeah, I so, think. If, go ahead. I think just just for context, I think you know, everyone having sort of I think still reeling in some ways from COVID nineteen and sort of grappling with how life has shifted substantially. I mean, even over Zoom. Um, or, uh, you know, welcoming so many people into our homes and sort of the uh, sometimes the craziness that happens on Zoom. So we'll see what unfolds here today for both of us. Um, but also, I think there's just really a lot of heightened uh, feelings and emotion and passion and energy. We've just gone through the midterms and that's been, you know, that's been, there's just, no matter where you sit, there's a lot of energy and there's a lot of feelings um, around the electoral cycle um, we've just had two college shootings, 
Um, and, you know, we have the war and famine and climate disasters. And so I think from a national tragedy perspective, I think that would be a great place to start. And I would like to also suggest how you might suggest we all approach these national tragedies as we think about, you know, as we're digesting all of these, um, all of these tragedies and how we cope with them and how um, we manage that stress in our daily life. Great. So I think we can put up um, the presentation. Um, and I've seen a couple of questions come in. I've been looking at the chat to uh, several people have asked questions and I'm definitely going to try to get to those. Um, and, and remind me again uh, as we get through this session. So um, we can put up the presentation. Great, thank you, Jenna. Uh, so I decided uh, today that the common thread for everything we're talking about is um, the stories that we tell, the stories that we hear, and the stories that we tell to each other. And it really allows us to understand um, the very personal experience of loss and healing, the narratives that um, people uh, share with us. Uh, Jenna, next slide, please. And just a, a brief sort of overview of what we're going to be talking about. And Joy and I will have, be having a conversation along with your questions. Children in grief, the stories of national tragedies separating public loss and private grief. And finally, the importance of stories as therapeutic and educational tools for communities, for young people, for clinicians, and those who provide grief support. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more after we um, get to that point in the presentation. So now we're going to skip ahead because this is sort of in the middle of my slides um, to slide number 18. Sorry, we have to give you a little preview of what else I'll be talking about. Everybody's getting a sneak peek. <laughs> and this um, actually is going to uh, begin. We're going to see a picture of David McCullough on the screen. <clears throat> and we're going to, we're almost there. Almost there, Go back a little bit. So while we're getting to slide number 18, let me uh, just tell you a little bit about how I came and became involved with, um, with Project Rebirth. Uh, it was after September 11th. And um, uh, let, me, let me just, uh, Jenna, it's all the way back to slide number 18. It's after, um, if there's a blank slide and then there's a picture of uh, David McCullough and, um, a scene from uh, John, Han uh, John Adams. Thanks. Uh, so I found out that there was a, um, a director who was very interested in filming, um, filming people who had gone through the September um, 11th crisis. And uh, so they um, were going to, they identified nine people and they, decided that they would meet these people every single year um, and follow their journey um, healing after September 11th. And, uh, you know, for young people today, um, it is, they don't necessarily have a recollection or they hear about it from their parents. So it's very difficult to talk about this without telling the stories that go along with it. And so I want to remind you and, and the, the great historian, David McCullough, um, who just died in the past year, uh, really, he's written extraordinary work. But one thing he said is that the people who watch a film are going to come away feeling um, that they were there in that moment of this particular historical event. 
And he said, I don't think you can really know something, really know it in your heart as well as in your mind, unless you feel it. That's the power of film. And today you'll probably notice that there is a thread of film um, and stories that, that bring all of these three uh, areas together. Next slide, please. So um, when we think about narrative and story, and, and this is really what um, we convinced um, the director of Rebirth that, that he had a bigger story to tell. I mean, how do you tell a story about you know, 3,000 people and children and affected by, uh, by this extraordinarily traumatic event. And he believed that we tell the big stories through the smaller narratives. And that's exactly what he did with these nine people that he followed over the course of, um, of seven years, you know, looking at their journey. So a narrative has a story, a teller, and a listener. And we often switch roles and when we're talking about those different events. Um, and the, in telling the story, the events can be intensified. It has a very profound effect. Now, storytelling is a potential power because they don't automatically teach us. We have to engage. We have to listen and we have to hear. And all of you who work with clients and grave, bereaved families and children and adults know what I'm talking about with the nature of storytelling. Next slide, please. Now, just a little background information about why this is so powerful. Um, because the nature of film and storytelling brings, it, it has an emotional contagion to it. Um, it really allows us to be triggered almost with the responses that we're hearing from the people. It's very unique to film only. It is, does not happen as often. Um, in a book, uh, with literature, with articles. And sometimes we'll hear people say, I, I went into the movie theater, it was dark, and I really began to appreciate this. Uh, next slide, please. So we also identify with, um, you can go to the next slide, please. You can also identify with the emotional response that we hear the emotion in this individual. We identify with them, we hear this from kids all the time uh, when, when we show them films or, or actually in books as well. We, we, we respond because we imagine, we know exactly what this character is going through. Next slide, please. <clears throat> and so we're also cultivating this moral imagination. Um, there, it's almost an artistic means of exercising a cultural, ima and cultural um, imagination as well opens up many possibilities. Next slide, please. There's two things that happen. We are elevated as we watch a film and we admire the people on the film. Elevation is that uplifting emotion that when we see people um, helping each other, we also have a sense of well-being as well. Admiration is also helps us imagine ourselves. This is why um, you hear people talk about um, uh, different commercials that they see, that they become tearful when they watch them because of that emotional elevation that we go through. Okay, next slide, please. So this is a quote from Brian, who is one of the nine <clears throat> featured uh, individuals in the film Rebirth. And if any of you have heard of the film, just drop me a little note in the in the chat i'd like to know if uh, you've seen it or if anyone in your family has and i'll talk more about how you can access all of these these little films the short films and then the, the larger film um, towards the end of the, our session so brian said i have hope that it's all going to work it's all going to be good at the end of the day we'll teach our children what happened and hopefully the world will be a better place when we finish that's all you can hope for and I think his words are so powerful given everything that is going on today as well, both the traumatic losses and the, um, the struggles that we have in connecting with each other. Uh, Brian lost his brother, who is a firefighter, on September 11th. So this is what he 
um, really felt after going through the whole process of seven years. And he worked on the um, he worked on the build, new building as well. And uh, the next slide, please. So let me tell you a little bit about um, these individuals. Um, Debbie is um, her son was a National Guardsman, was assigned to Ground Zero. And she saw him struggle with how he became challenged uh, during that time that he was bullied and he was, um, uh, you know, the subject of bias. And he also, also, he was told by his, uh, he was in the National Guard, he was told to cover up his name on his uniform so people wouldn't um, wouldn't be uh, know who, what his nationality was. It was very, very difficult. And Debbie also was very much um, subjected to a lot of discrimination. And yet she says, I'm grateful that I'm getting another day to live and continue to do the work that I so enjoy doing. Everything I do is for kids. Whatever decision I make it is always be on behalf of the kids. And that she's referring to the students that she works with, but that she had quite a and, difficult struggle. And Joelle, that, is that you? Can, Donna, can we, yeah, can we just pause for just a moment? Sure, because, absolutely. Um, and just, yeah, and there were a couple of, of, of comments in the chat that I want to make sure that we um, are able to address sort of in this, in this context. So, um, can you talk about, I know you were saying just a minute ago that September 11th has so much, uh, there's sort of so much overlap and similar experiences between September 11th and sort of where we are today, obviously right. for different reasons. Right. Um, can you talk a little bit about the role of support groups in communities and particularly when it comes to traumatic deaths like this um, and how how support groups can really be an added lens of support for individuals? Well, I, I, I think we cannot underestimate the value of support groups. I think they're extraordinarily important. As a matter of fact, using this film, uh, using Rebirth, we would screen the film and then we would have a group after that. Um, I actually um, coordinated one of the first virtual support groups for siblings who lost a family member, who lost a brother or sister after September 11th. And I think that we learned with the pandemic that we couldn't connect with individuals who, um, I just had a, a group session the other day with some middle schoolers and, um, and they said that um, they were talking about losses, losses from the pandemic. And they also talked about losing people that they knew in their community. And they had no way to connect with each other, to be face to face with with their colleagues, with their friends. And there was a lot to um, a lot of um, concern that they had that they couldn't be face to face with their friends. And you think, well, of course, they were on screen, just like we are all on screen today. But there is something very magical when kids are together, when all of us get together. And that is that we watch each other smile. We see the crinkle in, in someone's eye. We watch their, their movements and we can connect with them. So I, I, I cannot stress enough the importance of support groups, peer-to-peer -peer support, support that is facilitated, support that is um, by a professional or support that is uh, um, recognized um, with parents. And uh, we actually did that. Uh, <clears throat> we, meaning a group of uh, clinicians and I, worked with um, the New York, um, New York City did a whole 10-year anniversary uh, after 9-11. And we, we used um, books, uh, children's books that, that address the issue. And we brought people together in the same grade with parents and siblings. And we talked about those moments. Now, not everybody needs a support group right away. Uh, sometimes we have our own natural support groups go to, they could be through faith-based um, houses of worship. And, um, and that's very helpful. And sometimes at work, and, and I found this in my work with nurses and healthcare providers during the pandemic, they needed to be together. They needed to share their experiences. Uh, so I, and especially with traumatic loss, um, 
because it has to be, you have to facilitate that group so that there isn't this overwhelming sense of trauma that sort of hits people over the head. I was doing a support group for um, a group of teachers in a school that had had a, um, a, <clears throat> a terribly tragic father and son death. And it was, it was uh, intentional. It wasn't accidental. And um, <clears throat> The school um, was dealing with it as best they could. I worked with the, the principal to get the word out. But unfortunately, as you can imagine, what do you think happened? They, everyone heard about it from the media first. And um, so the next day I was at school with the teachers and there was a, um, a FEMA group that was doing a debrief. Now, I, I, I can't impress upon everyone enough that a debrief is not the same as a support group. And a debrief, you have to have the support after that because it becomes overwhelming. So here we are sitting in a big room and I'm I'm not facilitating these other two people were. And everybody is going around the room saying how they heard about it, what they remembered, how traumatized they were. So we get to the end and the facilitator says, okay, so we'll all get together tomorrow and we'll have um, a discussion about this. And I, I stood up and I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's talk about how you're feeling right now. Who are you going to go home to? Who will you talk about this with? How are you going to take care of yourself tonight? You can't just have people unload their traumatic responses to a particular situation and not get the support that they need. Um, so my answer is yes, we need support groups, but they're not debrief groups, which are, are very different and, and could really be problematic. Um, debriefing is mainly started mainly for um, emergency responders after a particular event, like a plane crash, something like that. But support groups are very different because people share as much as they want or they don't want to. And um, they can be open-ended, which means that people can drop in anytime they want, or they can actually um, be a series of six sessions, something like that. So um, I think that's the best thing that we can offer people struggling. I mean, we, I certainly, I was in Michigan on September 11th and um, people were going to churches. They were going to, um, you know, coffee houses. They were coming together in a very natural, organic way. Um, and so by the time you you know you could set up support groups, but by the time you get around to offering it, it might be not, not too late, but people need it right away. So um, it's really significant to pull people together and as me, easily and quickly as they can. Joy, I'll go ahead. Let me, yeah, let me ask because there's just another question um, in the in the chat about um, folks who want to support communities in the aftermath of, let's say, school shootings. Um, and these other sort of major tragedies. Can you can you shed some light on what's appropriate, what's not appropriate, what you've experienced, um, and what could be constructively helpful for both um, practitioners but also non-practitioners? You know, I think that when a support group arises from a community organization that's already in existence, that's the best possible scenario. When people come in from out of town, which we see in every single disaster, I saw it at Sandy Hook, I saw it on 9-11, I saw it in Katrina. Um, they come in, they use their talents and skills, but they don't have a relationship with the community. I, it's far better for those out of town experts to advise the people who are living in the community offering services. That's the ideal situation because then, and I've heard many people say this, well, then they're just going to leave. You know, they're going to come in, they're going to be there for two or three weeks and then they leave. And um, it, it's devastating because it's another loss for those individuals. So the best place is to have a plan intact for you to be able to offer those services um, that are in already existing agencies. I think, I think that's crucial. And crucial. And on that note, um, what about um, on that note? What about um, siblings? Can you say a little bit about sibling grief and just observing both, whether it's 
in the national in national tragedies or just for the just to sort of think and pause for a moment about the kiddos who are left behind um, and sort of how is that addressed? Well, of course, siblings are probably the most underserved um, community within um, the bereavement uh, sector uh, because there's all of these notions that um, they'll get over it, they're resilient, they'll be fine. And yet I haven't talked to one sibling who lost a, a brother or sister when they were children um, who have that attitude at all. It is devastating for them. They, they not only lose the sibling, but if there's been a long illness, they lose their parents as well. Because the parent then becomes so involved with the, with the sick child's care, the brother or sister who is sick, that they don't, um, they, they can't really comprehend um, how that impacts, how that affects um, that surviving sibling. Um, and I have seen a number of children and young people in therapy who had lost a, a brother or sister th through traumatic um, accident. And, um, and then as you know, we're getting close to the holidays, this is a really critical time of year for families. Um, and, and by the way, I just want to sort of do a sidebar. Um, I have lots of handouts that address some of these issues. So if people are interested, put your name and maybe email address in the chat. Is that okay, Joyelle? And I can get things well, to them or through you. Yeah, let's just in case um, we right. wouldn't, I mean, this will be on, this will be on YouTube. So we wouldn't want people's email addresses, but if you put your name in the chat or you send us a note, we'll certainly make sure that people receive follow-up resources. Great, um, that, that, would be that great. you have to offer. We know yeah. you have an awful lot of them. Yes. Um, so, so just so I'm I'm working with this young man who um, lost his brother, and uh, so now it's coming to the holiday time. And the parents decided that because it's so painful for them to talk about the holidays without this child, that they're not going to celebrate Christmas at all. They're going to just um, go someplace, go away, and no holidays. And his response to me when he was telling me about that situation is great. Now I don't even have Christmas. So it was a loss that it was another loss. So his whole life is beginning to change. Um, rather it's um, really effective to create new traditions honoring someone who has died and bringing the kids to the table and Erwin Sandler and I wrote a, a piece a couple of years ago about the holidays for um, mm -hmm. option B. So, um, you, you know, there's all kinds of things that you can do. It doesn't have to be just the pain of the loss. It could be the celebration of this holiday, this birthday, this moment, momentous occasion with a new tradition that is celebrated. Oh, that's wonderful. Now, we have a question in the chat as well about uh, living with the trauma of your child's unsolved murders. And I think that in and of itself is unique. And then I think to your point, we're about to enter into the holiday season or approaching that quickly. And can you say a little bit more about these more unique and, and in, some, in some ways very traumatic and unexpected deaths and how they resonate in, in unique ways for families? Right. Um, you know, it's such a good question, and it's surprising how often I, I've actually heard that very same question. The other, the other sort of ten, tangential um, issue that comes up is if somebody suddenly becomes ill and dies, and then there's all the what ifs that, you know, how could I have prevented this? And so we're always, it's human nature to really respond to um, what could I have done differently to prevent this happening? So, so part of that response is hum your, your own human response, your own human reaction to this. The other issue is that we, um, there are support groups for children uh, of, you know, murdered children. Uh, and I think you balance those, you could try it out. And I know that there was a chat question on the, in the chat saying, what if somebody doesn't wanna go to a support group? How do you get them there? Um, it takes a while, but um, we can talk about some strategies, but you, 
you need to think about what you get out of a of a support session so that if you and you you don't want to go you don't want to try it um or you do try it and it's not for you that is okay that's totally okay you can try to to do some other things individual work or counseling um using friends uh family members uh, as a support although i recommend not too much because um they will push back and um, and and be concerned that they're not helping as much as they could. But all of the people in this rebirth film, of course, went through something very similar. They were um, for a long time. No one knew. You know, there was no trial. There was nothing that that could be fixed, um, and there was no resolution. So it's all this unending, um, open. Um, unfinished business that we have. Now, I want to sort of give one of my, I, I have three caveats that I um, like to give people when we talk about these kinds of issues. Um, one is, and this actually began with um, the Oklahoma City bombing with Timothy McVeigh. And it was started by the media, actually. People say, well, I just need closure. I need closure. I need to know that this person is convicted. I, know, I need to know who it is. I need to know they're behind bars. I need to know they're executed. I need closure. It doesn't happen that way. There is no such thing as closure. There are moments of transition. And that is something that we can appreciate that, yes, there's a moment where perhaps they find out, you know, who, who committed the crime or who was responsible. Um, but it doesn't close anything. That is a, a, a misnomer for that, that situation. Um, <clears throat> likewise, there are no stages or phases of grief. Um, it, and, you know, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross did not intend for her stages of grief to be for those of people who are grieving. It was somebody grieving the loss of their own life. Uh, they were ill. And, and how do you process that? Just no such thing. It, grief is sort of like a feedback loop that you go through all these different situations and waves and um, and you can't really identify, oh, well, now I'm here and then I'm going to go there. Um, because then we begin to, to score ourselves on how we're doing. Um, right. So, and the other thing is that we can't, uh, we, we can't erase these memories. I mean, I had worked with enough families that some families went in and sort of took everything away and um, uh, decided to put away the photos and clean out the room and and that doesn't work like that either <laughs> it's a sort of a time that you really you'll know the time it is very organic when you experience that but in terms of the um very tragic um a murder or a death um where someone else is responsible and it's unresolved um that is something that you'll work on for your entire life. Um, it will maybe get a little bit easier, although there will always be that unfinished business, but it's really important to talk to someone about that. And, and again, be wary of going to focus groups or no, excuse me, not focus groups, but support groups where you'll hear a number of people talking about that. Then you begin to carry their trauma as well. And that's what I, you know, I caution people about all the time. Yeah, there is a really, I think, a very important question, actually, in the chat around this, um, that, um, and it's not a weird question at all, I think it's actually, it's, it's incredibly pertinent, um, that with all of your experience um, with, you know, death, loss, and bereavement, how do you manage your own emotions? How do you digest those? Um, how often are you crying for those that you're supporting? I mean, you know, and you and I have talked about this, it's both the family experience that, and the families that have to adjust and I think evolve, their, their stories evolve with their loss. And then there are the folks who attend to them, the front lines, who have to hear all of the stories and how, how to continue to attend to families in such a way where you too now are carrying pieces of these stories and, and how do you manage that? And certainly, you know, we saw so much, and you, you've seen so much through nursing um, and the COVID-19 pandemic. What would your suggestion be for individuals, you know, 
attending to families when these in these death events and how to how how to manage the emotional uh, heaviness of, of all of the things that they're experiencing and carrying. Well, um, first of all, great question. Not weird at all, um, because it's a question I hear all the time. Uh, how do you do this? How do you do this work? I guess there are a couple of key points. One is balance. That if you spend 100% of your work life dealing with these issues, um, it will begin to impact you. It will begin to impact you. Um, so that you can find, if you can balance it with other things in your life, in your week, that are joyful, that um, that feed your soul, um, that is really ideal. Because taking on, you, you're absolutely right, we do carry everyone else's stories with us. Um, and I, as a matter of fact, I um, have an exercise that I do with nurses, and I've actually done it with children, uh, called... Um, it's based on the book by the uh, Vietnam um, veteran, um, What We Carry. And so if we think about what do we carry in our hearts, in our backpacks, in our pockets, that weight is with us all the time. So how do we get rid of some of that weight? Because a lot of the nurses that I talked to during the pandemic, they couldn't talk about it at home with their families mm -hmm. because they didn't want to upset their families. And that's that's a real complicated situation for for all of us who do this work. Uh, so balance is the first thing. And recognize that the more you learn about something, the educational part of it, it helps diminish the emotional aspect of it. So that you, you learn about vicarious trauma, secondary traumatic stress. Um, you learn about how your own previous experiences, your own previous traumas influence um, how you respond to these moments. And I can tell you as uh, when I was in graduate school, um, I, we were seeing, we were learning how to do therapy and, uh, you know, ha had to meet with a patient for an hour and then transcribe the session probably for three hours after that and then present it in supervision. So if you didn't get upset the first time, you certainly were had two more opportunities. So I remember talking about one particular client that I had, and I can remember to this day his mannerisms, and he was talking about the loss of his grandmother. And uh, I had lost my grandmother when I was in nursing school. So I'm in a session. I don't think anything of it. <clears throat> I'm transcribing. I don't think anything of it. I get to supervision, and I begin to read my notes, and suddenly nothing's coming out of my mouth nothing. I cannot speak. And then I just start to cry. And my supervisor just very simply said, I think you have some grief work to do. So, and it was because I was thinking about my own grandmother. And I think there are those moments that some people will trigger us more than others because they remind us of someone. We see ourselves, our own families in, in those situations. But then in addition to balance, in addition to education, we think to ourselves, what am I supposed to learn from this? And I call this making meaning. What is it about this moment in time with this family, with this child, with this adult, that I am supposed to learn and inform my life? And, and I had one of those experiences. It was, um, it was about a, a, a woman who, a, whose husband died on uh, Pan Am 103. And I started to see them and I did home visits um, and three children. I got to see each one of the kids and I got to talk to her. And uh, she was probably one of the most um, engaging, practical, realistic people I've ever met, who is now faced with dealing with life without her husband and getting her children back to school. Because as you might remember, for those of us old enough to remember that time, it was around the holidays. And it was like two days before Christmas. And then, um, and the kids were going to have to go back to school. So I worked with them for about six or seven months. We, they made a lot of great progress. Part of it was because she was such an incredible person. And uh, 
and I'm not kidding, 25 years after I met her, I got an email one day. And she wrote this beautiful email saying how I had impacted her life and how mm -hmm. everything she learned, you know, from our sessions together made such a difference in her life. And I think we need to remember that more in the work that we do. It's yes, it's we are carrying those trauma, those traumatic stories, but it is about making meaning in our own lives as well. And I think that's um, that sustains me. That's how I get through it. And you also have to do all those things that you um, that feed your soul. And uh, you know, being out in nature, and um, and I did a lot of that with nurses uh, in the pandemic. You know, what are the things that give you pleasure? It's not just about yoga and meditation and breathing. It's about what music gives you joy. What do you read that is joyful? Do you write poetry? Do you write reflective um, passages? Gratitude is so important. Um, so I have um, a whole list of those kinds of things that you can do, and that's how you balance things in your life. And Donna, I actually, I mean, I wonder at what point do you recognize your own boundaries and you have to turn off the news or you have to, how do you do that? Mm -hmm. How do you recognize that as a, as a tactic itself? I'm, and I'm assuming, I know for me that's a tactic, um, but I'm, I'm just assuming that that could also be an additional tactic to try to limit yeah. the flood. Yeah. Of experiences. Yeah, I talk a lot about media um, and how you need to titrate the, um, you know, you've heard the term doom scrolling. And it's when people just can't get enough of, and I heard the nurses talking about this, they would say, oh, I can't, um, I, I, you know, I have to find out the, the latest statistics, the COVID statistics and where it is in my community and et cetera, et cetera. And, and that is, not healthy. It's not helpful. Um, you get as so. What I recommend is um, for children, especially, they should not be watching the news. Um, if they are older, they watch the news with their parent one time only, uh, without pref preferably without a lot of um, images, and um, once a day. That's it. Print is safer than um, electronic media or internet um, because you can read it, read something and talk about it and, and then put it away. And there's a whole process that you can work through with kids, especially about, well, why do you think they're telling the story this way? Sort of make it an educational experience, but for day-to-day -day work, and I, and I uh, have a client now who, um, a number of clients who work in emergency departments and um, they've, you know, they, you come away with these, stories that of you know bricks falling on a patient a person's head or somebody pushing someone else off a subway platform and what we have to realize and this is a strategy for secondary traumatic stress is that you don't um you have to recognize that what you're seeing is a very tight small sample of all of those kinds of things. And I've, I've, I'm working with forensic nurses who worked with sexual assault victims. You know, they would begin to look at every male as a potential, you know, victimizer. And recognizing that I'm seeing this tiny little slice of humanity, slice of experience, but that's not the reality of what is happening in the world. And there are a couple of news things that I think are fun to listen to um, that is literally one minute. Um, it's called Under the Table News. Give a giant plug for it because it's just one minute and you're done. Hmm. Go ahead. Is that, a, is that a podcast or is that? A, it is on TikTok and Instagram. Wonderful. Under the Table Under the Table News. So just, we have about 15 minutes left. And again, I just invite folks to, continue to ask questions. I want to make sure, though, that we get to the question around this generation of students um, and the pandemic traumas that have hovered above their lives. It was interesting. I had a conversation with uh, our one of our daughters recently who shared that she, she didn't realize that she had to relearn how to study again once she went back to school for so long. 
um, that there are just so many different challenges, whether it's studying, it's socialism, uh, it's socializing rather, you know, among one another. Can you say, um, I mean, what your thoughts are, any reflections on sort of, you know, I mean, coming out of the pandemic, some would say we are, some would say we aren't, but where we are with the pandemic now, where students and children are, how we attend to their experiences and their traumas and from, from COVID and all of the other things that have, that have, that have transpired in the nation. Well, it, it's, um, you know, I don't think we know everything yet about this. Um, I think that there are, there are compounding, sorry, the door slammed, um, compounding issues that we never recognized. For example, um, social media was there before the pandemic, and then it became so relied upon during, during the pandemic. And now it is, you know, again, we're still using social media. I don't think we're ever going to get away from it, but I think we have to recognize the role that um, not being face to face with each other, with students. I think that, you know, we learn from the students, they, their peer groups are so incredibly important to them. Um, you know, it's frightening when you see a group of kids maybe at a diner and maybe there's six of them sitting at a table and they're not, they're all on their phones and talking to each other through, you know, electronic media instead of putting their phones down and talking to each other face to face. So I think that there are, and then there is everything that happened in the pandemic. And um, so we have the social media factor. We also have, you know, what they saw happening around them. I mean, if you, and I know that all of you can recall this, you know, those first months was, they were terrifying. Um, you know, people were dying. We didn't know how to treat them. Um, and the students, um, you know, they, they didn't understand it as well. Um, there wasn't a lot of information other than just frightening information that came out. So they moved through this. And then we know that mental health has been an issue for a number of years now for kids. And I urge you to read the Surgeon General's report on mental health of children. Um, it's it, it's well, well laid out and he talks about all of the things that we can do each in our own respective areas. Um, so whether we are a parent or a teenager or a teacher or a health professional, there is something that we can do. Um, and it's just really important to know that the pandemic gave us a lens that magnified everything. And suddenly everything became much more apparent to us, the needs that we have. Um, mental health to, has been a huge issue for a long time. If you were to, for folks who are grieving, who have joined us today or who will view this, and you were to give them one piece of advice through the holidays, what would that be? Um, try to um, embrace the meaning of the holidays and what it meant to the person who is no longer with you. Um, share experiences with others who also feel the same way. Get through it together. Um, if it's too painful to um, do something with everyone or you know, as a, as a Christmas or Hanukkah or a New Year's um, celebration, Think about what you could do instead to honor that person. This is, this is about honoring the people in your life, honoring the way they um, celebrated the holidays, the way they um, brought in the new year, so that you, you have the loss of the individual, but you can hold on to the, the traditions that really bring that person closer to you and remember those things. That means digging through old pictures of old holidays and creating a new, um, you know, a new memory for that person. It's all about making memories and do the decision-making together as a family. Um, the last thing, and, and that means maybe about in about two weeks, sit down 
you know, so call family meeting and say, okay, um, this is going to be our first, you know, whatever without, you know, naming the person, the grandparent or a sibling. Let's talk about how we will get through this next, these next two months. And what can we do to celebrate this person's life as well as the, as the holiday and the tradition? Making what decisions together. And what if you're first, what if you're a frontline responder, a therapist or, you know, law enforcement or a firefighter, what would you suggest for people who are attending to those families? Um, a kind of the same message that, um, you know, be with each other, um, talk about how this, this work affects you, uh, recognize that there are things that you can do to help yourself heal and to um, really recognize what you need to do. And also recognize in each other, if you see a colleague who's struggling, reach out to that colleague. Um, you know, we talk about their psychological first aid and now their stress first aid, which is a wonderful program that helps people look at each other and say, I, I think you're, I, th I, th I see you struggling. And, uh, you know, I, I am too. Let's talk about how we can get through this together. Really recognizing so that no one has to go through this alone. And if you're, a, and if you are, caring for children? Is there anything um, specific? And, and I don't know if that is uh, younger children, and I, and I would wonder what you would define as younger children versus older children. Um, but are, are there any specific strategies as we enter the holidays for, for children specifically? Well, I, th I think if you think about elementary and younger versus um, high school and older, um, that okay. sort of gives you a, a little bit of a barometer to look at. Um, the younger children want to know that things aren't going to change. They, they still want to have um, a celebration. And um, the older teen, the older kids are, are probably going to want that as well. So get together with them and talk about it and how you're going to accomplish this. The little tiny ones that are, you know, toddler, preschool, um, they're going to get all that stuff in school with them um, and, and all of the you know, children of all ages will get this in school. And as a matter of fact, sometimes it's a little hard to navigate that because they see everybody else having, being excited about the holidays and they're going to be approaching the holidays differently. Um, so I think that, again, coming together as a family and, and just, you know, I always believe that the kids really have the best answers <laughs> and say, okay, this is the first year that we are going to have Hanukkah without grandpa, um, what do you think we should do to celebrate Hanukkah and honor grandpa? Um, and just, and it's not going to be a solved in one sit down session with family. It's going to be in a couple of sessions and, you know, and then, okay, what do you think? All right. So let's, let's do some research and let's see what we can find. Um, that's, they, it, it's about, you know, how do you protect them um, so that they don't feel so different than everyone else. They will. And that's why kids in bereavement centers who attend support groups do so well, because they're with other kids who know the situation, that they, they don't have to hesitate about what they're saying. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I have uh, two more questions for you. And so this first question is, um, just as we're getting ready to depart here, if we were stuck on a stranded island or on a, if we were stranded on an island and you mm -hmm. had to put in or put on one record, and we're assuming it's a record, uh, putting on one record and you were going to contribute to living on the stranded island with all of your other peers, what would you contribute to the community? So what record would you put in and then what would be your function within the community? <laughs> I love it. The desert island, of, you know, from the British yeah. BBC. Uh, uh, it's a, it's a great exercise. I love it. So I think I would. Um, my contribution would be um, Leonard Cohen, and uh, because he's a poet, in addition to being a songwriter, and he speaks truth, 
And my, um, my role, you want my role? I would make Excellent. sure, <laughs> I would make sure that um, people have three things that are important to them. Um, and that would be their interactions with other people, maybe a favorite food, and uh, maybe a book that they is important to them. Uh, you're a caretaker, a nurse <laughs> from the heart. A nurse uh, from the heart. Um, so where can people find you? Uh, okay, so should we you or continue to learn from can you? We, can we put up and put up the last yeah. few slides? Uh, because I have my yeah, Instagram absolutely. account there. Um, and uh, and then I'm actually I told Joy all this before. You can go to Jenna. You can go to the last. Uh, let's see the last. Let's start with um, fifty four slide fifty four. It's uh, Robin's Rowan. And I'll quickly go through these. Okay, mm -hmm. great. Thank you. All right. In the work that I've been doing over the past three and a half years, and and before that. I found um, some really interesting information about a tree that grows in uh, Ireland and Scotland. It's called the Rowan tree. It's an extraordinary tree that grows in the most hostile and environments. And um, again, we don't see them too, too often here in, um, in North America, but even though there's par they're parched uh, for water, and nutrient resources, they have a deep, extensive network of roots that reaches down into the ground for nourishment. It's thought to be in the Celtic um, mythology, um, a protector and gives courage and strength to those walking the path of spiritual growth and enlightenment. So um, there's a wonderful poem that is right here. And I will, uh, there's the last few lines that, um, and it's, it's really an amazing, uh, it's a metaphor for the growth that we all must uh, accomplish and how our strength um, for this wonderful tree. Um, and I'll tell you why um, it's important to me. Um, let's go to the slide 57. There's two things I wanna tell you all about. <clears throat> Everyone's been so patient with us jumping around. It's so great. Um, so this is a brand new book that's going to be coming out in April. And Joyelle, to your question about mental health and teens, this is the book that you want to be reading with your teens um, by Nora Carpenter and uh, Rocky Callan. It's called Absolutely Normal. And I and a colleague uh, are writing the discussion guide for parents and teachers on this. 16 fictional stories about teenagers and what they deal with in, in this world today in their mental health and, and their mental health. So for those of you um, who are thinking about mental health, this is what um, you need to read. And then next slide, please. And Donna, before we move to the next slide, um, sure. you're writing the discussion guide. So for Correct. example, whether you're a therapist or a parent or a grandparent and you're watching this, your discussion guide will help guide the um, those conversations. Guide the right. The conversation, the, great. Right. The book is the the book is the sixteen stories, and then uh, Carol and I are doing a mental health provider's guide, a parent guide, and a teacher guide. So that's oh, what, wonderful. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. So um, it's right now it's sixty pages. We have to pare it down a bit. So. <laughs> Um, because there's so much in these stories about how to communicate to kids and um, the kinds of things that they're dealing with with their peer group. It's absolutely incredible. Absolutely fabulous. Wonderful. Thank you, Donna. This is amazing. Okay. And then the last slide. Um, so I think if you hit the, um, the clicker again, it'll come up with a photo. Oh, maybe not. Okay. Okay. Just go to the next. Go to the next slide. Um, so um, I told Joyelle before that I was going to be making an announcement um, for everyone uh, on this uh, call, this webinar, and uh, 
today is um, the first day that I can announce that uh, my book, Courageous Wellbeing for Nurses, or if you want to, Courageous Wellbeing for Me, um, uh, is going to be published in uh, August of next year. And uh, it was, it's from the work that I did with nurses over the past three years. My co-author is a young woman who is a health and wellness coach, and it's called Courageous Wellbeing for Nurses, uh, Strategies for Renewal. So I'm, um, I'm thrilled, and I'm thrilled to announce it here. So um, oh, we're just so thrilled. Um, it's another amazing resource from Donna Gaffney. Um, so is this your Twitter account? Is this Instagram? I'm so sorry. This is I'm Instagram. It's fine. Instagram. Instagram. This is your Instagram. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, <clears throat> so with that, um, any any sort of last last questions? We're about to pop off here. Um, oh, uh, oh. So we have a question here about if there will be um, any other webinars where you'll get to go through your slides. All you know to go through all of your slides. Well, um, you know, I, I, Joelle, could you, could we post a PDF we, of the slides? We absolutely. Well, you know what I think, Donna, actually, I think if you're up to it, I think we could go ahead and do another recording um, sure. and post it on YouTube so that people can, um, so that people can go ahead and, and see it on their own time. And then that way, because I think I know some of what you would get into into your slides and it also would afford you much more time. Um, and there's some really important information that I think that you have to offer um, in those in those slides and, and in your guides and so forth. Um, so a couple questions. The webinar is taped. Um, it will be on Evermore's YouTube channel, which um, I have to tell you the way I find it, which is not too sophisticated, is I go to our website and then on the upper right side, there are the social icons and I, I click onto YouTube that way. Um, but we do post all of our um, conversations with experts there. And just to let folks know that we'll be um, meeting again live um, with Megan Devine on December 14th at two o'clock. And she, as many of you probably know, is just a wonderful uh, person and has written some pretty remarkable books. Um, one that I recommend to everyone is It's Okay That You're Not Okay. Um, and then she's also more recently written how to carry what can't be fixed. And so um, she'll have um, some advice for us uh, for the holidays, as well as a host of other things. We also in January will be hosting an in the know with Jeff Nowak, and he is an expert in family medical leave and talking to us about bereavement leave and, um, and what our rights are, or what families rights are or what they're not. Um, when it comes to um, when it comes to bereavement, so I just want to thank everyone so much for being here today, Donna, uh, and thank you so much for putting our our YouTube channel in the chat there, um, uh, Jenna or Sabina, and uh, Donna. We are so grateful to have had you here today, and thanks so much for everybody else. Um, we'll follow up with you with different resources, and um, we'll see you online. Bye.